up in Ruth chapter 3 tonight, and my goal is to get get through the book. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Amen. Uh, but just kind of a, a recap on uh, chapter 2. Uh, if you weren't here last week, you can pick up the CD, or I think it's on YouTube as well, right? So you can get on YouTube, check Pastor Isaac's teaching out, and uh, just kind of just to keep up with what's going on. Uh, but just a quick recap, we see in, chap uh, in chapter 1, you know, uh, as we read, Ruth, or not Ruth, uh, Naomi, uh, with, along with her husband and her two sons, moved from Bethlehem to Moab. And the reason for this is there's a great famine in, in the area, in the region. And uh, I was just thinking about this as we were singing, the effect of famines, you know, what famines can cause us to, to do or, or not to do. I think of uh, the prodigal son, remember that story in Luke in the Gospels? There was a famine in his time as well, and that caused him to go back to his father's house, right? So famines have a tendency to, to cause us to do, to, to, to kind of take notice of, hey, what's going on here, right? And sometimes we can hit some famines in our lives as well. You know, maybe some spiritual famines. Maybe, maybe you're going through a famine in your marriage. Uh, maybe uh, it's work-related or, or w maybe it's health, health issues, uh, uh, it can be a number of things, right? But famines, uh, I believe, have a tendency to dr to push us or draw us that much closer to God. And uh, just to cry out, we see our need for him, right? In that famine, we're, we're hungry and we're thirsty and we're starving, right? We're starving for, for God. So, so I thought that was pretty neat that it started with a famine and that, that caused them to move to Moab. And then as they got to Moab, we see that it didn't get any better. Uh, uh, she ends up losing her husband. And then she, her, her sons find two women from the area. They get married. And then they both end up dying. So now it's just the women alone. And, and in that day and age, that wasn't good. You needed a man. A man to take care of you, to provide, and, 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 and to give you security. So, and to carry on the, the, the family line, right? As we're going to look at tonight. That was a big deal. Carry on the family line. So they're left there alone to fend for themselves. Three women in Moab. And we know that it was during the time of the judges. And immorality ran wild. There was no king. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, right? So everybody's just kind of having a free-for-all. And you have these three women, defenseless, without a man, without protection, without food, without a job, without, I mean, things were looking pretty bad for them. So Naomi decides to move back to Bethlehem. And... Ruth decides to go with her. So they head back to Bethlehem, and we see that, that God has blessed Bethlehem, right? There's ample enough grain, there's food, and not by happenstance, Ruth goes to work in this certain individual's field, Boaz which we come to find out is a kinsman. He's related to a, a Elimelech, right? He's a relative, a male relative of Elimelech. So just to watch and see how God orchestrates that is amazing. It wasn't by coincidence that Ruth happened to go into this field, look for some grain to glean because there was a law that God had ordained that uh, when you when you harvest your fields, you know, leave some around the corners for the poor. 
for those that are destitute so that they can come along and glean from that field and acquire some grain right so she's out there gleaning in Boaz's field and we see that Boaz takes notice of her love at first sight amen he takes notice of Ruth he says who is this woman she's out there working for her keep you know she's not sitting back and expecting it to she's out there in the fields working hard from sun up to sun down you know and he says, hey, if you want, you can stay in my field and work the barley harvest and work the, the wheat harvest. You have plenty of work here. You don't have to go to another field. You can work here in my field. And you know what else? I got water. If you're thirsty, I got plenty of water. If you're hungry, I got food. And you can eat till you're full. And this is a stra a complete stranger, Ruth, a Moabite woman. You guys know the tension between the Moabites and the Israelites? They didn't have a very good relationship. They were at odds with each other. So Ruth, he says, I welcome you. You're a complete you're a foreigner, you're a stranger, but I welcome you. Come and sit with me, sup with me at my table. Right? So we just see this beautiful thing take place between Ruth and Boaz. And again, not by coincidence, right? God is in the midst of it. And <clears throat> one thing that I love uh, out of chapter 2 that Ruth responds to Boaz, she asks, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? You know, I think back uh, uh, in my life. Why did you take notice of me, God? I was out there in darkness, living for myself, hurting others, hurting myself. I cared about nobody. But yet you stopped and you took notice of me. And you shared your love with me. You shared your gospel message with me. Which then changed my heart, changed my life. And, and I really like how, how Ruth presents that to Boaz. Why me? What's so special about me, a foreigner, that you would take notice of me? And again, I see ha God's hand working in this right as we're going to see at the end of the book just a beautiful thing that takes place there but you know Paul even says I'm the chiefest of sinners right <laughs> he was persecuting Christians when Jesus encountered his life on the road to Damascus knocked him off his horse saved his life transformed him in a radical way used him for I mean he wrote the most of the the New New Testament, right? This man of God. So I think of Romans 5, 8, which says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we sang earlier, Oh, how he loves us. Amen. Oh, how he loves us. And that he would send his only son to die for me, a, a wretch, that I would be redeemed unto God the Father through the cross, through his death, amen? So I praise God for that. And uh, it's just neat how, how Boaz takes Ruth under his wings and provides for her every need. Isn't that what God does to us when we, when we, when we sin, surrender our lives to him? Doesn't he take care of all of our needs? You know? As it says in the Gospels, he provides for, we, ha we, we, we want not. He provides for every need. And, and we see that picture through Boaz as he, he protects Ruth. He, he tells the young man, stay away from her. She's off limits. Don't you touch her, right? He tells the young men that are working for him, you leave her alone. 
He tells the young woman, take her under your wings. You know, show her what to do. Show her, you know, where to go and what not to do. And, and so God is so good. And the two things that, that drive Naomi and Ruth back to Bethlehem are food and family, right? Food and family. There's a famine. They got to eat. They've lost the, the men in their lives. They're looking to carry on that family line. So those are the two things that they're, they're in need of, is food and family. So they head back to Bethlehem. But notice at the end of chapter 2, it, it, it states, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. So they got some food, right? She's working in the fields day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out. She's, they got food. But she hasn't found a husband yet. She's still living with her mother-in-law, right? You guys know what that's like? I don't. I've never, I've never lived with mine. So, Anyhow. All right, so let's pick up in chapter 3. And we're going to read the whole chapter. So, and then we'll kind of go back and just hit on some highlights. And So chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet, and he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also he said, Bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, Oh, all that the man had done for her. And she said, These six aphas of barley he gave me, for he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Amen? So, the mother-in-law, Naomi, cooks up this plan right she said we're going to find you a husband Ruth and this is how we're going to do it so for you single woman take note right take a bath 
That's the first thing we're going to start with. I'm going to get you all cleaned up. We're going to put some sweet smelling perfume and put your best dress on. And, and then we're going to go and we're going to visit Boaz at the threshing floor. But we're not going to meet him until he has eaten. We don't want to interrupt him before, before dinner, right? Uh, make sure he's got a full belly, he's cheerful, and, and he's good, right? So, so this is the plan that, that Naomi cooks up, right? And, you know, I think of, uh, I think of how I, I met my wife at work, you know, uh, kind of like Boaz and Ruth working in the fields, right? Uh, but that's how I met. You know, I don't know how you guys met, met your spouses, but... I just look back on how that took place, you know, and how she wooed me, right? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm as dense as, as can be. So she, 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 had, she, she was all in it, right? So, so we see this plan that Naomi has, but we know that God is greater, right? He had a bigger plan. He was all in it, right? But Naomi comes up with like... Uh, Ryan shared earlier, you know, we got plans, right? But God is the one that directs them. And that's what's taking place here, right? So she says, hey, Boaz is a relative. He's a kinsman, right? So, and take note how she, he, you know, I could just see her hiding in the, in the background, in the dark, waiting for Boaz to fall asleep, right? You know, he kind of rolls over. <laughs> Is he asleep yet? Maybe he's not. Maybe I should wait, right? So, and then she says, make sure you see where he lies down because she didn't want her going and laying down to some other, another worker in the field, right? Make sure it's Boaz you're laying next to, right? So she tells her, you know, wait till he falls asleep. Once he's asleep, you go up to him, uncover his feet, and lay at his feet, right? Which shows just a sign of surrender, of submission. And I think of when we came to Jesus, we came to the foot of the cross, right? And we just bowed down before Jesus' feet. We said, God, I'm done with my life. And that's what she did. Just imagine the faith in, in Ruth. As, as Naomi, she says, I, I will do all that you instruct me to do. She didn't take any shortcuts. She didn't take the scenic route. She didn't question it, right? She just said, okay, I'll do what, what you're telling me to do, Naomi. And, and don't we need that in life, good godly counsel? I don't believe Naomi was trying to mislead, mislead her or lead her astray, right? And she, was, she was instructing her. She was giving her good counsel. And, and if we're not finding that within the church body, where do you think we're going to go look for it? out there right in the world they're going to get us all twisted up they're going to get we're going to end up on a dead end road if we listen to that right so you know we got good godly leaders within our church body there's some solid women solid men you got any questions about life go and ask you know pray about it and and, and, I, and I thank God that we have those people in place in our lives that we can go to and say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, what do you say? What does God's word say, right? So she gives her good direction, right? And then, uh, you know, and then it says that he wakes up at midnight. I think, he, you know, you think, you know, your feet are uncovered and there's a cool breeze, right? Woo, you know, wakes him up, kind of startles him. So he says, who's there? She replies, well, it's, it's me, Ruth, your, your maidservant, right? And, and just think of how vulnerable she was, right? I mean, this could go either way. It could end up good or it could end up bad. He could take advantage of her, right? But we know that she had plenty of time to to get to know Boaz as she worked in the field and she got to know his character. He was a godly man, a righteous man, right? But it could have went either way. She's laying it all on the line, right? 
I'm going to go just submit myself at his feet. And he's either going to receive me or he's going to reject me. I got a 50-50 shot here, right? I'm laying out all on the line. And we see that Boaz, she, she says, hey, take your garment and cover me. And that was just another way of saying, I'm pursuing you for marriage. Would you marry me? Is what is the point she was making there. Cover me with your wing, right? And we see that in Ruth 2.12, this term is also used. It says, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And, you know, I just think of God's wings over us, right? He's our refuge. He's our strength. He's our strong tower. And, and he, he desires to, to protect us under his wings, right? As a hen does her chicks. You ever, you ever see that? You know, growing up on the farm or the ranch, these hands just brood over their chicks and kind of protect them and, and keep them safe. So, so Ruth here is saying, hey, I want you to marry me. He says, well, there's one thing. There's another guy before me. And just notice the, the honor in that, right? He could have said, yeah, sure, and kind of, disregarded this other this other man this other uh, relative but he says no uh, we're going to do this the right way and we're going to honor God and we're going to give this other man an opportunity to redeem you if he so chooses so in the morning we're going to go and talk to him and we're going to present this to him and give him that shot right so notice they didn't cut corners you know, and and there's no indication in the scriptures that that uh, that they were impure. So they remained pure before God and themselves, right? And you think of today, how many? So often you hear of it today. You know, people they're, they're not doing it the right way. They're jumping into things. Right, and then the next thing you know, there's a there's a child is born out of wedlock, and how God that just grieves God's heart, right? Just a sexual morality that's running rampant today. But you see, Boaz and Ruth decided to do it right, to honor God, to not cut corners. You think of Ruth in her situation. She could have been desperate, right? She said, I need a father. I need a husband right now. And she could have just went wherever and found a husband, right? But instead, she says, no, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it the right way. That's, that's just so, so neat. And, and it also refers to as a virtuous woman. You guys know Proverbs 31? Well, this is Ruth. She's known as a virtuous woman to all. And Boaz is known as a man of valor. Good character, right? He pays his, his help. He doesn't cheat him. He's respectable. He's, he's probably, uh, uh, he's, he has some role within the, the, the township, councilman of some sort. He's well-to-do. You know, he's established. I mean, this guy's got everything going for him right honorable so they lay there i could just think of their night together right he says hey just stay with me the night just, i don't think either one of them slept that night right looking up at the stars just taking it all in taking one another's presence in you know just the 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 courtship there right yet they didn't give in to temptation that's neat right it's unheard of today. That we would do the we let's do it the right way, right? So so that's neat. So the next day she she wakes up, he says, Hey, but one thing, keep this between me and you, right? He tells her, don't don't share this with, with anybody. So before she leaves, what does he do? He loads her up with more barley. 
Some people estimate it was like 30 to 50 to 60 pounds of barley he's loading her up with. This is a, Ruth can hold her own, right? She's got to carry this back home to Naomi, you know, not to be messed with. So, but take note that, uh, uh, where is that? I'm sorry, my notes are all goofed up here. Uh, in, in verse 17, it's not mentioned earlier in the chapter, but, but until now in the presence of, Na- of Naomi, okay? He tells Ruth, he says, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Why do, you think, why do you think it's mentioned in the presence of Naomi, but not earlier on in the chapter when he actually gives her the barley? Well, I think it's because back in chapter 121, remember when, when Naomi came back to Bethlehem, what did she say? She goes, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Do you think God's trying to talk to her right here? In a special, intimate way? He's saying, remember what you said when you came back to Bethlehem? You said you were empty. Well, guess what? I'm going to fill you up. I'm going to fill your house with barley. But not only that, you're gonna, I'm going to carry your family line. Right? He says, Ruth will have a husband. It may not look like it right now, but she's going to have a husband. And you will be fruitful again. Your family line will carry on, right? So isn't that neat how God speaks to our need and our doubts and our discouragement? God will give us a direct word when we need it. He says, hey, Naomi, remember you said you were empty? Well, look at you now. Your house is over full with barley. It's coming out of the doorways and the windows and flowing out of the chimney, right? He says, you're going to be full. You're empty, but I will fill you up. Amen? And isn't that what God does? He fills us up. So, I also want to bring your attention to a similar story back in Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 through 38. And it's similar in that it also involves two women. But instead of doing it the right way, they go about it the wrong way. (laughs) Right? Right? You guys are from you some of you might be familiar with the story, but Genesis nineteen, thirty through thirty eight. Then Lot went, Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and when we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. And you go in and lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. Isn't this where Ruth was from, the from the land of Moab. You see how the Moabites came about? Incestual relationship. Because they took matters into their own hands, right? They didn't wait upon the Lord to provide. They took matters into their own hands. And and thus we see uh, they did it in an impure fashion, whereas Ruth and Boaz did it in a pure fashion. Amen. So... 
There's two women. Uh, it, the other relation is that uh, they're trying to preserve their family line, right? And uh, so, yeah, just just the similarity there uh, of the two stories. So once Ruth, you know, she comes back to, to Naomi's house, and, of course, Naomi's like, well, what happened, right? How'd it go? Did he say yes, Right? When's the wedding scheduled for? You know, so Na Naomi's all giddy and she tells her what took place and she says, but there's a 50-50 there's chance because there's another guy in line. We got to go and, and kind of deal with that situation. So Naomi, I love Naomi's response to Ruth here towards the end of chapter three, right? She says, sit still and wait. Isn't that the hardest thing to do sometimes? Just wait not knowing what's going to take place next. You know, Ruth didn't know if this other guy was going to say, yeah, I'll take her, right? I'll be her redeemer. She didn't know if, if he'd say no. And Boaz then could step in and take her as his, his wife. So just think of the, the anxiety that she's going through the night before. Oh, no what's going to happen to me, my future, this is my future, right? But I love Naomi's response to her. She says, just sit and be still. And isn't that, you know, so true in our lives and when, when things arise and how, how often we want to take matters into our own hands and do something, right? I got to do something about this, Right? And how we make a mess of things. At least I do. I just mess things up when I get out there and get in the middle of things and, and get ahead of God, right? Instead of just waiting upon Him and letting Him guide and direct my life. And what peace comes from that, right? When we let God. Like the there's a saying, let go and let God, right? Let go. Just let go of it. Let God take, take charge of it. Who better to deal with your life than God and mine, right? The one who's seen the future, the beginning and the end of your life. Almighty God. So, so he's, you know, he says, hey, she says, just wait, wait. So here we are, chapter 4. So let's read it. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom, of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Oh, wow. What a coincidence, right? He just happened to show up. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother, Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem it, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, buy it, your, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate 
the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminidab. Aminidab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Amen. So, what a neat ending here, right? Uh, so this chapter takes place at the city gates. And this is where all public matters were squared away. It's kind of like an open court. And he brings ten witnesses with him, ten elders to witness this, this situation, right? So there's no, hey, well, he said, she said, and I didn't agree to that, and, you know, all that type of nonsense. He takes ten elders with him to... to to get it all out in the open so there's a public record of it and there's someone to witness it, right? So he presents this to this individual who is not named. He's not worthy to be named because we see that he declines his role as a kinsman redeemer. So he's not even, his name is not even given to us. But he's, and we know that in 20, uh, Leviticus 25.25, it tells us what this picture of a kinsman redeemer is. And if a man was poor and sold his land and did not have the funds to purchase it back within a year's period, then a male relative could, could purchase it back and then keep it in the family line. And in those days, land was important. I mean, that was their livelihood. That's how they, they, they made a living. You know, whether it's a grain or, or, or grapes or any type of produce, this was their livelihood. And land was, was, was valuable. So, and to keep that land within the family, you would then just pass it on to, to, to your son. And then he then would pass it on to his sons. And it would just remain within the family. And that's how they made a living. So land was very important. To, to folks in those days so so it and we know that the Elimelech sold the land before he went to Moab he sold it so now Naomi's back in Bethlehem and she says hey I have an opportunity to buy this land back but you're gonna have to buy it back for me because I have no money right so it's a no-brainer right it's a great investment so he presents this proposition to this other guy. The other guy, deal of a lifetime, right? I can't pass up on this. You better believe it. I'll redeem it. And then he says, but there's one catch. You got to marry Ruth. He thought, well, Naomi's past childbearing, right? She's of old age. There's a good chance she's not going to have any more kids. So my kids will inherit that property good I'm good with that well now Ruth comes into the picture she's of age she may still have an opportunity to have children if she has sons guess what they're gonna inherit that land 
there goes my inheritance, right? And on top of that, she's a Moabite. You want to marry a Moabite? You're an Israelite. How's that going to look, right? So Boaz knows what he's doing here. He makes this proposition. He goes, I'll take the land, but I won't take the wife, right? And he backs out of the deal. And you could just see uh, Ruth and Naomi in the background when he says, I'll redeem it. They're like, oh, no, right? But then as he goes further, he says, oh, you're going to have to take Ruth as your wife. She's part of the deal, too. He says, nope. You, you know, you think he probably already had a wife at home with kids. You just think another wife wouldn't be so good to add to the situation at home. Uh, I'm good, right? No, thank you. I'll pass. So then he gives him his sandal and he says, you buy it, right? And that was the custom. That's how they settled the deal. You give him a sandal off his foot, he said, it's yours. You redeem it, right? What a, you know? You just think of how Ruth's fate was in the hands of, of Boaz in his deal making, right? <laughs> so he, he makes a deal. He says, hey, he proclaims it. You know, I, I, I have the land. I've inherited. I've acquired the land. I've, I, I've acquired Ruth as my wife. And I will carry on this, this family line, right? So uh, end of story, right? Well, no, it doesn't end there. We see that in verse 13, it says, The Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. The Lord gave her conception. And, it, and there's another mention of this in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. It says, The Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Do you see God's hand working in all of this? Providing for Ruth and Naomi when they were destitute and alone and defenseless. God provided food for them. It wasn't of their own doing. God did it. And then he, he, gave her, he caused her to, to bear fruit and to have a child. And we see that 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 child's name was Obed. And through him came King David. Right? And it doesn't end there. Look at Matthew chapter 1. It goes on to King Jesus. So Ruth was in the family line of Jesus. Amazing, right? This Moabite woman had nothing going for her. Seemed like she had lost it all. But God says, no. I want to do something in your life. He says, okay. Let's go back to Bethlehem and see what happens. And God does the rest, right? And, and throughout the book of Ruth, we see God's loving kindness expressed over and over and over again. As both just lathers, Boaz lathers this upon Ruth, right? He's just so kind to her. Here, here's some more barley. Come and work in my fields. Glean from them, right? He doesn't reject her. He takes her in his family. And I think of how God is so pursuing. He never gives up, right? He's constant, constantly pursuing, pursuing pursuing and that he, he wants us to take in his redemption right to be cleansed of our sin to come into to his family to be right with him and you know I just I just think this is so neat and uh, you know the book begins with death and ends with life right you know, we see the three deaths of the males. And then it ends in a wedding and life. Naomi's holding her baby. She even nurses him 
Talk about fullness, right? You got your grandson and you're holding him. And that's how this ends. Full, complete, overflowing, right? And from a curse to a blessing, from bitterness to joy, from emptiness to fullness, from despair to hope. And this is what we find in Christ when we surrender our lives to Him. Amen? As He pursues and pursues, He doesn't let up. He's knocking on our heart, knocking on our door. Hey, come and sup with me. Sit at my table. Dip your bread in vinegar as Boaz did to Ruth, right? He even gave her a grain that was roasted, man. Talk about some good stuff, right? I got the good stuff. Here, Ruth, take some of this, right? Take your fill and be full. And in God, this is what God brings to our lives through his redemption. Uh, God pursues Ruth, an unbelieving Gentile, right at the time. And time and time again until he brings her in. And this is God's story to us, to you and I. That God would send his son to redeem mankind through his precious blood. He's pursuing all of humanity, even today. And he desires our redemption and to cover our sin. May we let him write his story on our heart. The same story that we see illustrated in Ruth, right? That we would let him write that on our hearts, that same story. And, and may we be a part of his story. And once we're... We are, we then can go and tell others of this story, making it known to all. Amen? And that's what this is all about. Once we've caught it, to go and share it with others, right? To welcome the foreigner. To welcome the outcast. The destitute. The poor. The ones that society discards of. Do we take notice of them? And stop? And say, hey. How can I love on you today? How can I show you God's kindness that wooed me to him? I can woo you to him. To, to, are we pointing others to Christ as Boaz did to Ruth? Amen? Just extending love. And that's what this is about. It doesn't end here. It just starts with us and what we do with this and where we take it. And if it's precious and written on our hearts, amen? And one other thing to take from this is that God is sovereign. He is sovereign, right? God is over every setback in your life and my life. Every setback that we've had, God has been there. Nothing is outside of his control. And we can trust in him in the worst of times. Amen? Even though it seems like it doesn't look good, there's no hope, there's no way out, we can put our trust in Almighty God, as, as Ruth did, right? It's not always gonna, going to be smooth and straight, but it will be satisfying, amen? It will be satisfying, it will be good, because we know that God is good. The best of times are yet to come, because I know that my Redeemer lives, amen? So with that, I don't know if there's time, probably not time for a closing song. So if you would stand with me, we'll close in prayer. I pray that this story ministered to you as it did me and his, his redemption at work, amen. Redeeming fall, all of fallen humanity unto God. That's his purpose. That's his will. He is so long-suffering toward us. Amen. So, God, we thank you for the book of Ruth. And we thank you for your picture of love in and through it, interwoven through that book, Lord. Your loving kindness, which leads us to repentance, which draws us to a place of complete surrender before you, God. I thank you for the story that you've written on our hearts. I pray that we would take it and share it with others. And not hide it under a basket. But Lord, share it with love and truth. I pray your blessing over the church body. That you would strengthen us, God. Even in our times of trouble. That we would know that you are God. And that you are good. And that you are sovereign, Lord. 
and that nothing is out of your control, even when things look like they are. You're right there, right next to us, God, taking us from Moab to Bethlehem, providing for every need, and filling us up, Lord, to measure. So we thank you that you are God and that we can trust in you in all areas of our life. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.